Yeah, I go. Hi, you guys. Y'all already know what time it is. Time to get on in this house and eat with Mom and Paula. So, we are eating today. Mixed vegetables. Baked potato. Baked um, carrots. And a baked steak. And then, of course, I have a roll. And I put jelly on it, of course. And, y'all, I've been waiting to eat this all day. I've been waiting to cook this all day. So, we're not going, I'm not going to do a lot of talking and not eat. I'm going to talk and eat. So, first bite. Mmm. Potatoes, good. And, of course, you guys, I have my Diet Pepsi. Just to let you know, it's Diet Pepsi. This bottom. Y'all know I love Diet Pepsi. It's my favorite, but this is so good. I've been waiting all day. So, and y'all, I've been trying not to eat. I want to try not to eat so much starch and bread, but I have to eat some starch, some kind of starch, because I am a diabetic. And I take insulin. So I have to have some starch. So. And my bread. I want to replace my bread with Napa cabbage. I don't know if you guys have ever tried Napa cabbage. When you go to the market. And go to the vegetables where you have the cabbage and all that. It's that one that's cut in half. You only see a half. That's the Napa cabbage. Now. I, I used to wonder what it was. Like, what kind of cabbage is that? They only give you a half. That's not enough to feed my family. Like, how many of them do I have to buy? But I watched the, I think it's called the Hagerman's family. And they, they boil eggs a little bit. And they wrap their food in them. I haven't tried wrapping my food in them. But I don't boil it because I like the taste the way it is. It's really, really nice. Um, It tastes great. Sometimes, if I don't even eat, I might have a taste for a snack, and I just go and take me like two pieces off and wash it off real good and dry it off and eat it. The taste is amazing, you guys. I'm telling you. Try the Napa cabbage. It is really, really good. It's really good. But, um... This is good, you guys. I love vegetables. I can eat any kind of vegetable. Brussels sprouts, sprouts squash. Um, when I was young, my grandmother used to make, um, what is it called? Okra. That's the only thing I really don't like. Now, I'll eat it in soup. But I don't know how I used to make it. It used to be sticky. But I'll eat it in soup. In vegetable soup, I'll eat it. Mmm. Your carrots are so good. A lot of people don't like carrots, but carrots are really good. But yeah, I eat the okra in soup. But, um, other than that, my grandma used to eat. She used to make eggplant also. And I didn't really care for that either. But, um, I've seen people cook it different ways. So, I wouldn't mind trying it. So. Hmm. This is good. You know how some foods you like and you cook and the fat have all the, all the flavor? Has all the flavor. But yeah, with the Napa cabbage, I think I'm going to make me some chicken strips and cut them up and roll them up in there and eat them. This is all fat, you guys. I don't eat that much fat. I like the fat, but not that much. I eat that strip. 
Now, when I eat ham, I like the skin on the ham. It has such a, a good flavor. Diet Pepsi. <coughs> I'm going to try to replace my Diet Pepsi, y'all, for one month, 30 days. I'm going to try to do all water. I'm going to try. Mm. Y'all, I love vegetables. I really do. Mmm. You see how easy it was to bathe into? And how it just come apart? That was really good. Really good. Mmm. I've been waiting for this all day. I really have. Yeah. I love vegetables. I like potatoes. I love potatoes. I love a baked potatoes. I like fried potatoes. And see, because I like homemade french fries, because I like the potato. Something I shouldn't have a lot of, because I'm a diabetic. And I do take insulin. So I have to I'm I have to eat some kind of starch because I take insulin. But I'm trying not to eat as much starch. I've been a diabetic for like twenty three years. And y'all let me tell you, it has been a journey. I went from a person not taking any medicine to being diabetic. <laughs> and it was hard for me to accept that. It was really hard. And my friends and stuff used to always say, you know you're supposed to eat that. I had one friend. She used to always say, it's diabetes awareness month. And I'd be like, and eh, what that mean to me? I really didn't accept it for years and years. I just recently started accepting the fact that I'm a diabetic. They tell you that it's going to mess with your eyes and all that stuff. And I'm telling you that that is absolutely true. Absolutely true. So when they told me I didn't got it, I only had to take the pills. Well, being stubborn and hard-headed, wouldn't do what I want to do. I didn't take the pills. I did what I wanted to do for two years. So, on the time I went back to the doctors, and they tested me and everything, they was like, "Now you got to do pills and insulin. It was still hard for me to accept it. I did it sometimes. I did it when I wanted to. I did what I wanted to do. You know, so like I said, it was a real it was a, it was it was hard. It really was. I'm sorry. Because I never had to take medicine. So now you tell me I gotta take insulin and pills. I don't even like needles. When they say, I got to get my blood drawer, the first thing I ask them, is it going to be one shot, one stick? And it just lasts like, I hope so. I say, you and me both. I remember a time being in the hospital, y'all, and they kept trying to give me an IV. And the lady could not do it. 
She said my veins, they collapse or something. I have collapsing veins or something. And she was trying to do it, y'all. And she did it like three times. And I told her, look, enough is enough. We're not doing this no more. At all. She was like, well, let me find somebody else to do it. So I was like, well, I hope they are more experienced because we're not doing this. So somebody else came in. One lady, another lady came in. Well, real story. And when I said one stick, because she already stuck me enough, the lady was like, well, I'm going to give it somebody else. She didn't even try. So... They had somebody else to come in. And I said the same thing to her. I said to anybody that's trying to stick me. And it was one stick, y'all. It was one stick. But whenever I go to the hospital, I always come out with my arms bruised. Because of them sticking me. You know, at one time, they had some machine they wanted to use. So they can see the vein. But y'all, the needle was so long that they wanted to stick in me, to stick down in me so they could see. And I refused it. I was like, oh my gosh, no, we're not doing that. Mm -mm. I can't do that one. So, y'all. So as far as my insulin, I adjusted to doing it myself. I do a flex pin. I like that better. Than the actual needle needle so but if anyone that's watching this do a diabetic and they tell you to take medicine or watch what you eat and stuff i'm a living testimony please don't be hard-headed listen to your doctor i actually had one doctor that used to fuss me out all the time and tell me, I am not going to help you kill yourself. And that's what he used to tell me. I just look at him. I got to a point. I was like, oh my gosh, I got a doctor appointment. I do not want to go out and start hearing his mouth. They got to a point. It was stressful for me to go to the doctor. So, but I'm so proud of myself because, y'all, I'm finally getting it together. I'm learning. What's my answer then? How much I eat and um, my portions. Like if I eat a meal and it don't have a lot of shots, I only take half of my dosage because I don't want my numbers to drop. So my doctor was like, "I am so proud of you, y'all." My A one C used to be like fourteen. My last A one C I just did was eight point one. I'm not the only way I'm supposed to be, but I'm a whole lot better than the way I was. So, and she was like, she was like, my dad was like, I'm about to cry. And I'm so proud of you. you. You finally getting it. I was like, yeah, you ain't got, yeah. I really say you ain't got to tell me twice, so that's a lie, because they told me 50 times. And y'all, if you mess with your, your, your eyesight, Mess with your feet. It messes with everything. And they used to tell me that. But you know how we can be hard headed and stubborn. So now I'm getting the gavel. After 20 something years, y'all. That's terrible. But I couldn't accept that. But I accept it. But I also believe that God, well, I don't believe, I also know that God is a healer. Because y'all during the pandemic, I was in the hospital for like 21 days. Oxygen. I couldn't breathe. I thought it was my asthma after nothing. And I would walk around and I just couldn't breathe. I couldn't 
if I go up two steps, I would be out of breath. I remember I was taking my kids to the playground, and the playground was like right here, and my house was right here. And in between, I had to stop and hold on to a car because I couldn't breathe. When we got across the street. I had to sit down. So, at nighttime, I was sweating real bad. So, my daughter was like, why don't you go to the doctor? I was like, no, I just need to take an asthma treatment. Well, I was taking an asthma treatment. And I was like, I don't know why they're not working. So, you know, in the middle of the night, I had to go to the bathroom. The bathroom was, like, right across from my room. Like, really, like, directly, like, right across from my room. I walked from... My room to the bathroom, I and mean, I thought I was going to pass out. I was not getting enough oxygen. So, I told my daughter, we got to go to the emergency room. So, got to the emergency room, and I told her, I can't walk up to the emergency room. So, she went and got somebody in a wheelchair. And they came in. She came and got me. The lady came and got me. My daughter couldn't come in because it was a pandemic, so, you know, could nobody go to the can nobody go inside unless she was being seen. When I got in there, I heard him say, I was talking about my, my oxygen level. It was really, really, really low. Really low. So they took me straight to a room and put me on oxygen. I was on one, I didn't even know it was two different oxygens. They put me on one oxygen and it wasn't giving me enough. So they put me on this other one. And y'all, this other one, that air blew out so hard. I mean, really, really hard. Like you on a motorcycle and you just in the wind and the air just blowing. And I guess that wasn't enough because that only goes to like five units or something. I don't know, y'all. Next thing I know, I was, with, I was in ICU. So I asked them, the nurse, my nurse, and I was like, why am I in ICU? He was like, because you was one step away from being on life support. I was like, how are you going to put me on life support and I'm talking to you and I'm breathing? He was like, you wasn't getting enough oxygen. We was great. We was going to um, sedate you and put you on life support. And I was like, so, then I forget, so I stayed in ICU for a couple of days. And then I went, um, then they moved me off left floor, off the ICU. And I kept asking, when can I go home, y'all? I, I was crying, everything. I missed my children, I missed my grandchildren, everything, y'all. I was. But I was trying to be humble. And my girlfriend was telling me, Paula, stay in there and let them do what you want, do what they need to do. And it was crazy because when I would talk to my mother on the phone, and when I get to crying, she was like, okay, you getting out of breath now, I'm going to hang up. And she would hang up. She was like, you're using too much action, you're going to get out of breath. And I said, hang up. So I remember the doctor asked me, how you doing? And I just bust out crying. And then I was going to go home the next day, but that night I started getting fevers and sweating, having night sweats. They kept me in there like an extra five days. I was like, oh my goodness. It started being every night. They was, I was having fevers. And I was just real, real cold and I was shaking and I was sweating. And they was giving me a little more pack, them little heat packs and stuff. I don't know. So, they couldn't figure out what it was. I had the infectious disease doctor. I had the lung doctor. I had, I had, all, I had like five different doctors. Cause they was like, we can't figure out what's going on with you. And they had took the x-ray when I first got there and they said I had pneumonia in my lungs. So I remember the doctor used to come there and be like, like, let me come in and see this mystery patient. 
Because she was like, you is not what I expected to see. She was like, looking at your x-ray, I did not expect to see somebody sitting up, talking, not hooked up to stuff, and everything. She said, you, not, you do not look like what I expected. So, I remember being on the oxygen. This was the second oxygen machine, the one that blew out real fast. And then I told the nurse, I said, I'm going home, Ma. <laughs> he was like, you think so? I said, yeah, I was still in the ICU. I said, yup. He said, I'm sad to tell you that you, even when you leave ICU, you're not going home. You, And when you do go home, you're going on an oxygen machine. But they put me on another floor, and you know, that's how I got with ICU, the other oxygen. I told him, I said, well, I'm getting out of this ICU. And he was like, not as long as you on five units on this, app, this um, machine. I said, well, you can drop it down something because I'm not standing in ICU. And he looked at me like, I said, you don't know the God I serve. The God I serve is a healer. I'm not staying on this machine. I'm going down on another floor. I'm getting out of ICU. Y'all in ICU, they got a alarm on your bed. You can't get out the bed. The bathrooms don't have a shower. You can't take a shower. When I was there, I was like, where's the shower? He was like, this is ICU. Our patients are usually not walking and talking. I was like, why didn't you take a shower? I said, well, I need a lot of towels on the floor because I'm going to stand in here like I'm taking a shower. I had water just running down. He was like, well, you can't do anything until I come in there. I couldn't do nothing without a nurse. Nothing in ICU without a nurse. You can't get out the bed, the alarm go off. You can't do nothing when I was a nurse. I had to let him know where to take a shower. I had to sit in the chair and do it. I couldn't stand up and do it. I was like, I'm getting out of ICU. I got to get out of here. So, after I told him about the guard I served, my oxygen got better, and I got off of that machine, and I was able to go down to another floor. You know, God is just amazing. God is awesome. You know, he do stuff for us when we don't even deserve it. You know, when we don't even deserve it, he do for us. He just don't give up. You know, and that's just, he's just amazing. Like, I've done so many things in my life. You know, I did all stuff. I, I've done what I wanted to do. And came back to God. And he never left me. He never left me. I left. He never left me. Came back, and it's like he welcomes you with open arms even after you leave and come back. He don't hold grudges. He's not vindictive. Or well, none of that stuff. He don't throw stuff in your face. You know, when he forgives you, he forgives you. He was not like man. So when I bring it up, when you gonna start talking. Or, oh, remember when you did this to me? And all that stuff. Or, oh, yeah, that's why I did that. Because you did such and such to me. God is not like that. He is gentle. He is generous. He is kind. All while being humble. I mean... just amazing that the love he shows us when we don't deserve it.
you know? It's like when we get in relationships and we keep trying and trying and a person keep doing us wrong, eventually we throw our hands up and say enough is enough when we ain't doing it. God don't do that to us. You know, he gave his only begotten son to die for us. And he don't throw his hands up and do that to us. So it's just amazing. Like who will give their son to die for you? And you doing what you want to do. You know, not worrying about nothing at all. And they still willing to do this. We didn't deserve it. You know. And I didn't mean to turn this into a, a session with the Bible. I was reading and I, about the children of Israel. How he kept providing for them. Got them out of captivity. And every step of the way, they complained. You brought me to this desert. And we're going to die in no food. You know. Every step of the way. They complain. And. And I was reading that. And I had to ask. I had to search myself and be like. God please forgive me. If I am a complainer. And help me to do better. You know. Because I don't want to be ungrateful. About anything. When I was in there and I couldn't breathe. I started appreciating oxygen. To me, that's the first and the most the, the, the most important blessing of the day. When he breathes into your nostrils and you're up, you, you wake up to see another day. That's the biggest and uh, blessing of the day. Take it from a person who was limited with oxygen. I, was, I went home. On the oxygen tank. I was on oxygen at home for like, I don't even know how long. It was a good minute. And then I went off of the oxygen and went back on. You know, so I was walking around with an oxygen tank. Had one in my car. I had all of the whole lot of them lined up in my house. You know, um, I had this big sign on my door talking about oxygen in use and and look at me. I don't have an oxygen tank, y'all. I'm breathing very well on my own. Oh, my God. And I just went through all that. And, well, I did, I did, I said my grace before I turned the camera on with y'all. But just for y'all who think I didn't, God, I ask you to, you know, Bless the food that I have already eaten. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. But I already said my grace, but I should have said it on camera. Instead of waiting. You know, I should have waited. I should have waited. But I wasn't the only person eating. I'm more sure you hear people in the background. So, it was already said, but I should have waited. I'm sorry, y'all. I said grace without y'all. Well, at least I ate with y'all. But I did say grace without y'all, so... My apology. As a young people say, my bad. It won't happen again. Well, I thank you guys for your time. I thank you for listening to me talk. And I would love to hear your feedback. For you to talk back to me. So, until next time, friends. Bye.